Few Americans in the 1750s are bothered by their connection to the British Empire. After all, it provides opportunities for trade and commerce, as well as military protection and political stability. And for the most part, the English government leaves the colonies alone. When one tries to understand the build-up to the American Revolution, I think it's absolutely crucial to think of this not so much in terms of right and wrong, and more in terms of increasingly divergent conceptions and expectations of what the imperial relationship will be like. I think the British Empire between the late 17th century and oh, seven, the 1760s uh, really did evolve into a working federal state, that is, with a very significant division of power and authority between the central state uh, and the participating colonies. Uh, and it was one that worked quite well, but never had any sort of sustaining ideology or legal uh, apparatus that could explain why power should be divided the way it was. One discovers that there are very different assumptions behind the way Parliament's behaving and the way the colonists are, are behaving. The colonists increasingly see themselves as equal to the mother country. They become increasingly self-confident. Um, Benjamin Franklin's expectation that at some point population growth in the colonies would dictate that the capital of the British Empire be shifted to North America is, I think, a sign of just how self-confident um, colonists were becoming about the place where they lived. The imperial authorities, on the other hand, assumed that the colonies were very much inferior, that the government in London had the right to dictate law and policy and taxation. The, the fact that they hadn't exercised this power very much during the first half of the 18th century didn't in any way take away from the fact that they thought they had that power. You can go all the way back to the 1630s and find Englishmen uh, who are saying, we've got to watch these colonies, they may just set up on their own one of these days. You hardly ever find somebody who's born in the colonies who has fantasies of an independent America. In many respects, the colonists feel stronger ties to England than to each other. They rarely work together, even when threatened by a common enemy, the French and their Indian allies. The Ohio Valley in the 18th century is the area in which you have strong Indian confederacies, you have the French, and you have the British. And the French are primarily interested in the fur trade. The English want to expand, they want to engross the land, take it over, get people on it. New France is quite underpopulated compared to British America. They are interested in happy relations with the Indians who are their partners in trade. So the French and the English have different interests. For much of the 18th century, different Indian groups were quite adroit in playing the French and the English off against each other, in extracting concessions from them, uh, allying with one side or the other, or withholding alliance at different times in order to extract concessions. So there is a kind of balance of power among all three of these groups in the Ohio Valley un until really the 1750s. It is in 1754 that the long-standing struggle between France and England erupts in the Seven Years' War. It breaks out when young Colonel George Washington of Virginia, who'd been a surveyor, went out to tell the French not to try and build a fort there. Uh, the French wouldn't listen to him, so he came back again. Uh, the French by then were building Fort Duquesne at what's now Pittsburgh. Washington found out there was a French patrol there. Near him, he attacked the patrol, wiped most of it out. Uh, it was shocked when one of his Indian allies uh, basically tomahawked to death the French commander of that expedition. And the French then retaliated and forced Washington to surrender, but allowed him to march back to Virginia. So uh, his first military encounter is, uh, A, not at all successful, and secondly, he starts a world war. At first, the war is fairly contained. But in 1756, it explodes into a conflict of international proportions. 
after William Pitt becomes the war minister in 1757, they do decide to make North America their main theater of operations, which hadn't been true in earlier uh, struggles between France and Britain. Well, that was a, a new policy um, by the British Empire, to send uh, ships and men and munitions and money as never before to North America and to make their prime goal the conquest of Canada. And so the colonists found themselves suddenly host to very large numbers of British troops and British sailors, an infusion of a lot of British money being spent in their colonies. It brought the colonists and British officials and British officers together as never before on a much larger scale. And they didn't always like what they saw in one another choruses of demands coming out of British officials in the middle 1750s. Parliament's got to tax the colonies, and Benjamin Franklin tells them, don't do it, bad idea. Uh, instead, Pitt comes up with something they tried briefly in the previous war, a subsidy system, uh, which is by no means paying for all the expenses the colonies are at for this war. But he sets aside a fixed amount of money. For the first several years, it's 200,000 pounds. Uh, and uh, then it's 133,000 pounds. The colony governments can divide up this money in direct proportion to how much you contribute to this year's war effort. Uh, and the result is the colonies pay for over half the cost of their own military effort. For the first time, the colonists find themselves working together against a common foe. Certainly uh, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania after about 1756 uh, and all the New England colonies are very much into this war effort. I don't know that anybody's ever really calculated this, but my guess would be that there are about 60,000 armed Anglo-Americans who are closing in on New France, which has only uh, 70,000, 75,000 people uh, in it. And that is what leads to the conquest of New France by 1760, and it really is decisive. You know. It, uh, it really does change the face of North America. What role does Spain, the other major power on the North American continent, play in this conflict? Usually Spain and France had been allies in these wars against Britain. Uh, Spain decided to remain neutral uh, in the Seven Years' War. Uh, and uh, for bizarre reasons, uh, what we're beginning to learn is they're afraid of the British, they're also afraid of the French. So Spain decided to sit this one out uh, until about early 1762, after the fall of New France, after the French have lost two of their major sugar islands. So the British just turn their juggernaut against the Spanish and take Havana and take uh, Manila in the Philippines. Uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, the, the Spanish say, ah, you know, let's make peace. And they do make peace. And actually, in order to get Havana back, they turn Florida over to, uh, to the British. By the end of the war, British holdings in North America have changed dramatically. They picked up half of Louisiana. They got the half that was on the eastern bank of the Mississippi, whereas the French gave the western half of Louisiana to their Spanish allies as a consolation prize for having fought with them and lost. The British got everything east of the Mississippi and north of the Great Lakes, while the French were, were evicted from North America. But of course, in the great heart of North America, the great sweep of most of this geography, the inhabitants were primarily Indians who were not consulted in this peace treaty and who thought of the European presence in their midst, a few forts, a few trading posts, as there by their permission. England finds itself at peace for the first time in more than 50 years. But it's an uncertain peace. But it was in large part their success in the Seven Years' War that created a lot of problems for them because they, they gained a continent, or half a continent anyway, and it was a continent with a lot of built-in problems. The imperial authorities came away from the war convinced that they needed to solidify their huge investment in saving the colonies from the French in Canada um, by asserting a much clearer control over the colonies. The colonists, on the other hand, felt that they had given huge amounts of manpower, they had made financial contributions, they, they felt that they had earned an equal place within the empire. 
Again, if you look at Pitt's subsidy system, you know, the, what's now 133,000 pounds a year, well, the British, after the war, are spending over 400,000 pounds a year on the British Army and artillery and Indian presence. Uh, 133 would have been something of a bargain, it seems to me, uh, and it would have encouraged the colonists to participate actively and voluntarily in the system. Instead, they demobilize all of the provincials, uh, decide to run the West only with the British Army. Uh, I, I think they have very good intentions in all of this. For one thing, they, uh, they assumed that the settlers uh, would antagonize the Indians sooner rather than later. What they didn't realize was that the army was already doing that. And so basically the British provoke this massive Indian resistance, Pontiac's War in 1763-64, in which almost every British garrison in the West is overrun in 1763. The big exceptions were Detroit and Niagara and Fort Pitt, and they all did manage to hold out. Primarily, the Indians object to traders and settlers moving on to lands they consider their own. The British government attempts to control the situation by issuing the Proclamation of 1763, forbidding settlers from advancing into territory west of the Appalachian Mountains. It didn't actually stop people getting up and going. If you wanted to go out there and take up squatters' rights, you could do it, and a lot of people did. Uh, and in fact, a lot of people did so in order to leave behind various debts or bad marriages. Uh, Daniel Boone, who becomes famous as the founder of Kentucky, was fleeing a sheriff's warrant for debt in Virginia. The sheriff subpoena says, you know, gone to Kentucky, <laughs> you know, absconded to Kentucky. So actual people going over the mountains uh, didn't stop. What the proclamation did do, however, and this bothered the planters a lot, was invalidate any potential land titles so that you could not open up land legally and, and have a valid claim to it, which meant that you couldn't develop that land and you couldn't sell it. Their attempt after 1763 were to station agents and uh, supervisors of the Indian territories to manage settlement in a controlled way, to keep antagonisms with the natives from building up, uh, and in general, to assure a tranquil life there so that they wouldn't have wars to fight in the borderland. And on the whole, they failed. I mean, there was, there was constant uproar in these areas. The British government, in a time period in which they were trying to exert many different kinds of control over North America, political and economic, as well as control of the territories, were failing to maintain control over the newly opened lands. It is in part to pay for the cost of administering this new continental empire that the British begin enacting a series of financial revenue acts in 1764. Because you're growing rapidly, your population doubles every generation, eventually you should be able to pay all the cost of your defense. But for now, let's just start with the Sugar Act, which is mostly a tax on molasses coming from the French islands, uh, and the Stamp Tax, uh, Stamp Act of 1765, which is mostly a tax on legal documents, uh, almost self-enforcing, because uh, the Act says that these these documents will be of no legal force whatever unless they are printed on stamp paper. As to the Stamp Act, the first bad consequences attending it I take to be this. Our courts of judicature must inevitably be shut up, for it is impossible, or next of kin to it under our present circumstances, that the Act of Parliament can be complied with, were we ever so willing to enforce the execution. For not to say, which alone would be sufficient, that we have not money to pay the stamps, I fancy the merchants of Great Britain trading to the colonies will not be among the last to wish for a repeal of it. And the question was, well, does Parliament have the authority to do all of this? And Parliament said, well, we don't see any difference between passing the Navigation Acts back in the 17th century and passing the Sugar Act tax or the Stamp Act tax today. And the colonists are saying, no, there's got to be some distinction of what Parliament can do and what Parliament can't do. But on the whole, they'll concede the power of of Parliament to regulate their trade. But they do increasingly say, you can't tax us for revenue. One reason the British were so baffled by the Americans' behavior was this was a people not at all oppressed. They were much less heavily taxed than the British, than people living in Britain were. 
uh, they had their own self-government, they had considerable leeway in all kinds of ways. The colonial assemblies had a great deal of power and indeed seemed to have gained in power over the course of the 18th century. And Americans, so they, when they looked at the Americans, they thought, what are these people complaining about? What did they've got everything you know, they could want? And even the Americans <laughs> thought that to, to a surprising degree. The series of crises that marked the 1760s eventually subside not because of resolutions by colonial assemblies or riots in American cities, but because economic pressures force England to back down. The northern colonies, it appears, are endeavoring to adopt this scheme. In my opinion, it is a good one, provided that it can be carried pretty generally into execution. If the gentlemen in their several counties would be at some pains to explain matters to the people and stimulate them to a cordial agreement to purchase none but certain enumerated articles out of any of the stores after such a period, not import nor purchase any themselves, this, if it did The not movement to boycott British goods I mean, could bring together people for very different reasons. The Virginia planters supported the boycott because... Here was an excuse not to spend lots of money they didn't have without surrendering the appearance of wealth and gentility. In Massachusetts, in New England, generally, also the boycott was, was widely supported. But there, there was a strong impetus, a strong motivation grounded in a kind of moral reformation. If Britain was given over to luxury and vice and laziness and corruption, Americans could be self-sacrificing, frugal, lean and mean in a way. And so here we have support for the boycott for very different reasons. One of the ways of looking at the revolution is to see Great Britain uh, embarking on what is uh, ultimately a self-fulfilling, not just prophecy, but nightmare. Uh, almost everything that they're doing after 1763 is driving the colonists to a position where the colonists were not going on their own. There was a concerted effort to get rid of the duties that were imposed by uh, called the Townsend Duties at the end of the 60s, in which, again, brought people together in committees uh, that became consolidated within certain provinces and then became trans-provincial and finally continental-sized. But the basic force that was at work through these years was a buildup of apprehension, of fear, that they were being subjected to a familiar kind of political pressure which would end in the destruction of what they prided themselves on as British liberties. And uh, the way the British government managed these apprehensions, or rather failed to, is one of the key elements in this whole history. There's one crisis after another. The British take one action, the Americans see it in a certain way. The British pull back a little bit. Then they try something else a couple of years later. The Americans are outraged by that. And every one is, a kind, is one more nail in the, in the faith that Americans have in this particular British ministry or this particular British crown. An event in Boston ignites colonial resentment to a new level of intensity. It's a clash between really working class people in the city of Boston and one of the bodies of British troops that had been brought in to keep order in what had become one of the most disorderly of the American cities in the colonies. A group of workmen, and there were a sizable number of blacks and mulattoes, mixed bloods, uh, people that were black with some white blood, um, confront a body of British troops and begin to taunt them for attacking and taking away the liberties of Americans who should be treated like free Englishmen. And it leads to a riot and a clash in which the British troops fire on this group of what they will see as rabble. And they will kill people who were either slaves or runaway slaves or recently freed blacks along with free whites. And African Americans from that moment will say that they were participants at the beginning of that struggle for liberty. Crispus Attucks, a mulatto who was one of the, probably the rowdiest of the workmen, is among the first to die. And blacks will claim that they shed some of the earliest blood in what now begins to be the fight for freedom from Great Britain. Although the next three years appear relatively calm, growing resistance simmers just below the surface. When they saw things like the stationing of troops in a peaceful area such as happened in Boston in 1768, when they saw a very small episode but which became in their minds very aggravated 
uh, what is uh, thought of as the Boston Massacre, uh, where five people were shot by the troops, uh, where they uh, saw customs officers clamping down control that hadn't been there before, where they saw controls of the judicial system that hadn't been there before, where they saw courts were being transplanted to different uh, areas in order to keep away from the pressure of local uh, political uh, groups. When they saw many things of this kind building up uh, over the years, it fitted a pattern of what they considered to be tyranny in free states. And the buildup of opposition was initially slow, but uh, it grew in ways that became more and more consolidated. This was a more diversified society and a society that was, in fact, had significant groups that were not culturally identified with England. The Scots-Irish didn't like the English. The Germans clearly were not identified with the English. So those are forms of divergence. Another problem that arises in the way in which Americans uh, thought about themselves is the, the very dynamism and growth of the American economy and American society. There were elements, there were aspects of British society and culture that were no longer good fits with the American colonies. The fact that the American economy and population were growing so quickly and, and dynamically meant that it was no longer so easily corralled within the British economic system and that the, the Navigation Acts or the mercantilist policies, the customs regulations, all of these things become, they pinch more and more as the American colonies grow. What is it we are contending against? Is it against paying the duty of three pence per pound on tea because burthensome? No. It is the right only we have all along disputed. I think the Parliament of Great Britain hath no more right to put their hands into my pocket without my consent than I have to put my hands into yours for money. And this being already urged to them in a firm but decent manner by all the colonies, what reason is there to expect anything from their justice? to jump ahead to 1774 after the Bostonians, rather than pay the tax on tea, they dumped these 340 plus chests of tea into Boston Harbor. Uh, and uh, this, though, happens in December, just as Parliament is coming into session in London, and so the British reaction is very swift. Uh, and uh, uh, the British decide, well, what are we going to do about this? Well, they have a range of choices, and the simplest was, all right, let's shut down the port of Boston until the tea is paid for. And that law is the first one that passes, and there's a gap of several months before they pass the Massachusetts Government Act, which uh, basically voids the uh, Massachusetts Second Charter of 1691 and imposes as a conventional royal government on Massachusetts. In response to these two intolerable acts, the First Continental Congress convenes in Philadelphia. At this early stage, Congress doesn't think of itself as a government. It's trying to develop principal resistance to uh, the so-called intolerable acts, or what Parliament called the coercive acts, a program adopted by the First Continental Congress, which was supposed to get the Parliament to back it down and restore peace, didn't work. A few regiments had now been sent to Boston, who were supposed to intimidate the whole colony. What happened was that the colony intimidated the army, and the army is really confined to just Boston. Uh, so the royal governor, General Gage, in Boston, controls Boston and Charlestown across Boston Harbor, and nothing else. Uh, and the settlers, through their various voluntary mechanisms, control the rest of the colony. General Gage receives orders to assert his authority, to gain control of the interior. But Gage hesitates, with good reason. The massing supplies at Concord Inland, uh, where the Navy can't get at them, uh, so send an army stealthily by night to go out there and, you know, take all of those, and if possible, arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Uh, and what they find, that they're lucky that they are able, the British, to get the expedition back to Boston, and without sending over a thousand reinforcements, which meant them in Lexington, they probably would have all been wiped out, uh, of those on the original expedition. So that's what starts the war, you know, uh, uh, Parliament's effort to take over the internal affairs of a particular colony, and they didn't have the resources to do it. The buildup of animosity over the years we're talking about, 1760, 1776, over this uh, period of time, uh, came out of a sense of fear, largely, on the part of political leaders, and one has to say leaders, because the whole population was not deeply involved at this, especially at the start, but people uh, in public life, sensitive to public movements and the possibilities of what would happen in public life, uh, 
increasingly felt apprehension about what they saw the British government was doing. You could look at a number of points in the 60s and 70s and say, if the British had not been so high-handed, if the British had recognized early on what they were dealing with, had the Americans and the British found ways to compromise because there were a number of these plans, uh, sure, it could have, they could have gotten through the 60s and the 70s. But I think that there are deeper structural problems that have to do with the, the growth and sophistication of American society that would have made it increasingly difficult and uncomfortable for Americans to sit calmly within an imperial system. It is not immediately clear to the British, and even to many Americans, that the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord are the first battles of a war. Many see them as simply another example of the tensions that have been plaguing Anglo-American relations for years. But whether or not they recognize it, the British and Americans have taken a decisive step. The war for independence has begun.